Hello, assalamu alaikum, adabers. I'm Benish Ahmed, your host for Azadi Now. Welcome to another one of our live broadcasts. Today, we pause to reflect on the Syrian revolution 10 years on. To do so, we are in conversation today with some important Syrian voices. I'd like to introduce you to Ala al Sufi, Muhammad al Attar, Noura Ghazi, and Shiam Galion. Our first panelist, Ala al Sufi. Ala, who goes by they and them, arrived to Turtle Island five and a half years ago. Ever since, they've been working to raise awareness about as well as make links to the Syrian revolution with the activist scene where they are by being involved in various struggles, such as the land back efforts, Black Lives Matter, queer rights, advocating for housing rights, as well as migrant rights. Our next panelist is Muhammad Al-Attar. Muhammad is a Syrian playwright and a dramaturg. He's considered an important chronicler of war-torn Syria. He studied English literature at Damascus University and theatrical studies at the Higher Institute for Dramatic Arts in Damascus. He also has a master's in applied drama from Goldsmiths University of London. His plays have been staged in many languages at various international theaters and in venues around the world. They include Withdrawal 2007, Sama 2008, Online. 2011. Could you please look into the camera? 2011. A Chance Encounter in 2012. Antigone of Stalia, 2014. While I Was Waiting, 2016. And many more, the last one being Damascus, 2045 in 2019. Al Attar has written for numerous magazines and newspapers with a special focus on Syrian uprising since 2011. Our next panelist is Noura Ghazi. Noura is a human rights lawyer. She has helped over 1,000 detainees and their families in Syria. She's a co-founder and executive director of No Photo Zone, an organization providing legal assistant, assistance, empowerment, and advocacy for detainees and their families and families of those forcibly disappeared in Syria. She's been advocating for human rights of the Syrian people internationally. Her work has been covered by the BBC, the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Al Jazeera, among others. In 2018, Ghazi was named Amnesty International as by Amnesty International as one of the eight kick-ass women standing up for Syrian rights. She's from Damascus, Syria, and lives and works in Beirut, Lebanon. And our final speaker and um, is Shem Galion. Shiam is a US-based Syrian writer. She's a member of the Syrian women's political movement and is a current communications coordinator at War Resisters League, the oldest secular pacifist anti-war organization in the United States. Welcome to Azadi Now. It's a pleasure to have you join us. In this episode, we explore the following themes. We consider what significance the Syrian uprising held for the Syrian people 10 years ago and what it means to them today. We also consider what it means for the Syrian people to be properly represented in the media, how the pandemic has been experienced by the Syrian people living in both in and outside Syria, and finally, how those of us who care about Syria can be in solidarity with the Syrian people today in a good way. Our show is divided into three segments today. In the first segment, we consider the themes I just mentioned in a panel format. In the second segment, we show a brief preview of a documentary called Syria Was Once a Beautiful Country. It was released um, in early 2021, uh, and it centers Syrian children's voices. And then the third segment, which includes a question and answer segment with our live audience. So let's get into our segment one. Uh, this is a question for all of you. Where were you when the uprising began and what, was, what, what are your earliest memories of it? Uh, how about we start um, just uh, with the, maybe with, um, um, uh, you know, reversing the order uh, with Shiam uh, in my introductions. Uh, so uh, Shiam, if you could respond to that. 
Um, where was I? I well, I was in the United States, um, and I remember I I was an undergrad um, in college, and I remember um, it was a big moment because before the twenty eleven uprisings the way that the Middle East was seen in the United States was like, I would get questions all the time, like, why don't people want democracy? Um, you know, you guys don't really want democracy. You keep elected or you keep having dictators. And this was um, a, nar a, a narrative shift. It felt like uh, we were just, we were entering a new world. Um, and I, um, I'm, I, I'm very actually, I'm, I'm very eager to hear from, because I'm the only one who was born outside of the US. Um, and all my other panelists, Ada, Noura, and Hamad, um, I'm very interested to hear where they were. Um, I know I was 21 and it, yeah, it was um, a total uh, paradigm shift for me politically. Um, in terms of also recognizing Arab nationalism and understanding myself differently as an Arab person um, and really coming into, you know, into my Syrianness. Um, but I, I think their answers are going to be more interesting. So I'm going to pass the mic. Who would like to go? I would say let's uh, go next to Noura. Um, okay, thank you so much. Um, actually, it, I, I remember for, for sure that it was Friday afternoon at 18th of March uh, 2011. Um, I used to sleep on, on like most of Fridays because it's the weekend in, in Syria. And I remember that my father woke me up and told me to come quickly to the living room to watch the news and say loudly and extremely uh he was extremely happy uh he said there is a demonstration in dara i ran away to the tv and saw what was happening it was like unforgettable moment uh actually since the beginning of the uprising in tunisia and egypt i used to meet my friends in, in damascus who most of them were from eastern Ghouta, and planned protest in in damascus but what happened in dara was a surprise uh, to all of us. And um, I pass it to Hamad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you, Panesh. And thank you for the organizers of this uh, panel. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you and with my uh, colleagues and panelists. Uh, yeah, I mean, this question brings a lot of memory, of course. I mean, uh, precisely, actually, for the first, uh, for the from the 15th of the till the 30 of March, unfortunately, I was not in Syria. I was um, uh, in a work-related trip uh, to Sharjah in U UAE. There was uh, the, uh, the Pioneer, uh, the art festival in Sharjah, and I was doing work there. And I remember very well, I cannot forget, when I was returning to my hotel, I saw a friend, he's a Syrian filmmaker, Osama Muhammad, in the lobby of the hotel. He was also there for work-related, uh, of course, uh, a thing and he told me um, and I can't even recall his face now uh, he told me they went out today uh, I told whom like I was really like overwhelmed and uh, by work not by <laughs> and he said yeah it, they went, it was 15 of March actually that was uh, the demo in Damascus Noura mentioned 18 which for me also the remarkable date and uh, the big date it's the, the for me, at least personally, the official, uh, um, I mean, maybe start of the Syrian uh, revolution in Dara, but 15 March, there was a demo in the heart of Damascus, a small one, but a very great one and unexpected, I would say. And I have here to mention that uh, uh, with the uprising in Tunis and then what happened, uh, the domino effect, especially uh, the scenes from Tahrir Square, um, there was an anticipation, but saying that, I have to say that um, also at the same time, we 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 felt that it's 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 next to impossible to happen in Syria because we knew our regime very well. We knew the brutality. We knew the 
the way that the security and intelligence is controlling um, the, the uh, like I mean, firmly controlling uh, all aspects of the uh, Syrian society. So, so I do remember that moment when Osama Hamad, the filmmaker, told me, "I cut my travel to uh, to uh, to Sharjah and I returned on the first of April. My first demo, I went to Douma." Because still demonstrations in heart of Damascus, where I live, or in the city center, or around it, um, of course, uh, because it's a stronghold of the Syrian regime and the Syrian security uh, uh, and police and intelligence, uh, I, I went to, to Douma in the Eastern Ghouta uh, to take part in the first demo, and um, I, it's really hard to describe my emotions. Uh, it was early April. It was. Um, yeah, really, even uh, 10 years, like, I, it's hard to describe or to, to recall uh, the, uh, precisely how I felt that day. But it was, uh, yeah, something that uh, I think will live with me uh, forever. Thank you for and, sharing uh, that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe Allah yeah. now, Allah is there. Yeah. Hi. Um, for me, what I remember most is... Um, Actually, something that happened a few weeks before it started, uh, when the when they were when the protests were happening in Tunis and Egypt, um, I had just graduated high school. I was nineteen, and I remember a teacher asking me, um, "When is Syria's turn?" And I told him, "No, it won't happen for us. Like, um, we're like our government is different. We have." tanks on the street we'd have like just complete mass arrests and it won't happen and but i was wrong a few weeks later it did happen and i was just really surprised really inspired really like uh, just like yeah like there's no words to sell it to like see the people sort of um just overcome that fear because like um i don't know how i sort of made that prediction like like nothing had happened like of the sort but like i just knew our government would do that you know and but yeah like the people like proved me wrong and they went out and like i've been inspired ever since mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's like my like formative memory of uh, revolution. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that. Um, my uh, next question uh, dwells a little bit deeper into this. Um, I'm going to propose that we go uh, back from Allah to um, uh, Muhammad in that order. Um, can you tell us uh, what the uprising's significance was to you as a Syrian person uh, when it started? What do you think you and other people were seeking um, uh, in this uprising, through this uprising? Allah? Oh, me, sorry. Uh, yeah, like I said, uh, it was a shock, like, uh, uh, like totally not expected. And like, for me, like I was like really young. It was sort of my first, um, like really cause that I believed in. Like it was, it's like what, um, just what like galvanized me into activism and, um, uh, I had, like, I still have hopes for, like, what our country could be when, because, uh, like, the Assad's have ruled us for close to, like, 50 years. Uh, Hafiz, Ilhan uh, uh that's a saying we have, like, damn his soul. Um, like, ruled for 30, for 30, uh, for 29 years. And now his son, which is, like, effectively a monarchy like just not in name and that's not what we want and like i still dream of uh, the day where he steps down or is removed and i can finally go back because i know i um i know i can't uh, 
while he's in power, like, uh, just, uh, like, you would need to be, like, obedient and show deference, and I just know I can't, and, like, Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that that uh, uh, n Next, uh, we can have Mohammed. I'm just going to repeat the question, um, and you're welcome to ask me any of the panelists to repeat the question because I know that uh, sometimes um, with uh, what we're hearing from other panelists, we um, uh, can get so engrossed that we uh, just need a gentle uh, refresher. So uh, what was the uprising's significance to the Syrian people back when it started? And uh, what, were they, what were they seeking, do you think? What was its significance to you? Uh, it simply meant hope, uh, really briefly, just one word. It meant hope. It meant that uh, finally... Um, we have a glimpse of hope, like to change this uh, uh, bleak uh, statical. Uh, Allah mentioned that this uh, it's a dynasty, the Assad dynasty, like we've been ruled uh, since 1970 by the Assad family. But uh, even before, like uh, almost 10 years before, by the Ba'ath uh, party also, the, the, the ruling party. So uh, my generation, I mean, I, I'm uh, older than Allah and maybe Shiam and Nura and uh, not maybe for sure. So when the revolution started, I was 30. And for for, for, for a man, I, I mean, okay, I, I born and lived all this time in, in Damascus and Syria, studied and... Um, for my generation, we grew up in a state of fear. We grew up uh, uh, knowing that we have no margins uh, of freedom of expressions, of, of, of organization, uh, to organize ourselves in any way or form or shape. Uh, my, I mean, a lot of my friends, again, from my generation, they already left Syria. Those who stayed there, they were seeking any opportunity to leave. Uh, so uh, uh, the revolution was, I would say, again, it's hope, but also, also it gave us for the first time, I speak about my generation now, huh? more precisely, uh, the sense of belonging. I mean, we felt that, yes, I mean, this, we belong here and uh, this place um, deserves better. We knew that, but but the, the, uh, especially the early days of the revolution showed us concretely with the potential of the people, the potential of the place and what we deserve and what the people deserve and what Syria should be and could be. So this is a big thing. And and actually, these early days, the, the first months of the peaceful revolution, I think uh, I would claim that what keep uh, some hope alive in us, because we saw this, we were an eyewitnesses, you know, and we saw this and we knew that if we have not too much, just just some margins, you know, to organize, to work, uh, to 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 express ourselves freely, uh, to 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 debate freely, because also we have different ideas, and, and it's good to have this conflict of ideas and and and, and strategies and visions. Uh, we can we can do uh, great things. We can do um, uh, uh, concrete things. We can move forward, and we can take uh, our country to a better place, a place that. Uh, we've been denied for decades now. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, uh, Noura, would you like to go next? Yeah, I, actually, I totally agree what uh, Mohammed has said, uh, especially that uh, I think I'm in the same age with him. Uh, so for me, like it was, it was not weird uh, or new for me to go to protest as I I grew up in a kind of political environment. Like my father was uh, enforceably disappeared and uh, arbitrarily detained for many times uh, for many years, but. At this time, like the early days, the first day of the uh, of the revolution, I think that it was the time of the real confrontation with the fear. Um, and for me, like 2011, as I, I was 30 at this time, it was very important year for me. And also it was like the most 
amazing and important here in my life, especially that at the early days uh, of the revolution in Duma, uh, during a demonstration in April, early April, I, I met my late husband, Basil Safadi, and um, like my relationship with Basel uh, is like a kind of my own revolution. Uh, for sure, we we demanded uh, basic of the main demands was release the political prisoners and prisoners of conscience. We demanded dignity, freedom, and democracy. And uh, I feel so sad that nowadays a lot of Syrians are seeking many issues, uh, especially people inside Syria or the neighboring countries. Uh, maybe besides. Uh, their their first demands. Um, they are uh, seeking now their safety, um, their daily needs, um, the right to to safe return. And um, sadly, that um, under all this dictatorship and violence in in Syria, especially by the Syrian regime, like most of Syrian, a lot of Syrian actually. Um, now are seeking different demands maybe sometimes regardless of those demands of the uh, early days of the uh, revolution um, maybe one of the most demands uh, since the beginning and until now is the right to know the fates and the whereabouts of their uh, enforced disappeared beloved ones mm -hmm. actually and um, yeah i think it's for shiam now thank you Thanks, Nora. Um, I, Vinish, could you repeat the question? Because I have so yeah. many ideas in my head right now. Um, of course, no yeah. problem. I'm so happy uh, to do this. Uh, what was the significance um, of this uprising for the Syrian people back when it started, and particularly for you? Um, what do you think what they were seeking? What were you seeking out of this revolution? I think the significance for Syrians in diaspora who were outside of the country, um, about half of all Syrians lived outside of the country before the revolution, um, was that we had these narratives of um, who was the good, like who was the good and who was the bad actors in the world. Um, specifically in the United States, it was a very common narrative um, that the United States is like the main driver of like everything that was wrong in the region. Um, I work for an anti-war organization. There are plenty of things that we need to hold the United States accountable for. Um, we don't need to give them more credit than <laughs> what, what the US has done is already bad enough that we don't need to say that they've done everything. Um, and it's, Honestly, it was really just a paradigm shift. Also, I think before the 2011 revolutions, um, there was, at least I think for me, as someone who was very young, this like sense of pan-Arabism. Oh, like we're all Arab people. Um, and then after the revolution, it was like, no, I'm Syrian, you're Egyptian, and not everybody is Arab. And that's actually, we want to all live together like, and not just kind of make everything homogenous. Um, a lot of the authoritarian leaders in the region used pan-Arabism as um, like a key part of, of positioning themselves as like the defenders of the Arab people. Um, and again, there are plenty of things that Israel needs to be held accountable for. Um, right now, you know, there's a neighborhood in Jerusalem, Sheikh Jarrah, that uh, settlers are like stealing homes from Palestinian people. Um, in addition to Israel, there are also the, the Arab authoritarian leaders um, who also need to be held accountable. Um, I would also say when Nora was saying, I think that's really beautiful when you were saying your relationship with your um, late husband Bassid was a revolution in and of itself. Um, I, I, I after the revolution was the first time I met other Syrians who weren't my own family because of what Mohammed was saying about the security state. Um, and it just, uh, it was just, it was just 
like becoming new people because the stories that we had been told about who we were um, were just very clearly like not right to hear the sound. You know, the theme song um, when the children are saying Azadi, Azadi, um, there's just something so beautiful about hearing people say, like to hear your community say something. It just really awakens something in you. Um, yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, yeah, no worries. Uh, Shim, can you tell us what what uh, you were mentioning um, with the Syrian children asking for Azadi? Uh, for the Kashmiri community, we also ask for Azadi, but it means uh, liberation and freedom uh, and a kind of oh, self-determination. Yes. So what oh. were you referring to with the Syrian community? Right. So I was saying um, the song for this show, when there's like, there's oh. like yeah, okay. um, yeah, you know, it just, it, it, it's just really beautiful to hear. And it, I think that um, that the Syrian cause is an international cause because mm -hmm. authoritarianism is global. Um, and, you know, through um, pushing and advocating um, for human rights, I've gotten to meet other people, um, including people from the Kashmiri community and the similarities between security states, you know, like, um, these states, they train each other. The United States will train the security forces uh, in other countries. The United States used the Assad regime to torture its uh, detainees when it didn't want to torture itself. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll stop there. Oh, thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, my next question um, is, uh, uh, let's uh, see. What I'm going to do is uh, for this round, Let's just do what we did uh, earlier. Let's go uh, to Allah first, and then Muhammad Al Atar, Nura, and then Chiam. Um, so uh, the next question is: How did uh, the uprising affect you and your family, your work? Um, and then, uh, if you can transition into also speaking about what the significance of the uh, uprising for you is today, ten years on. Um, uh, in this anniversary year? Um, when it first started, like, um, like our entire family, like just really um, supported it and like um, gave to it. Um, uh, we tried, um, helping and sort of, uh, I, I won't share details and names, but like we tried um, helping in grassroots efforts to like, um, uh, like uh, the areas that were um, liberated from government control. We wanted to show that we can like actually um, like live and thrive without like uh, that dictator government we have like um we were really invested in it uh, we still are but just not as easy anymore i guess um sorry can you repeat the question I'm just... you know of course um how did it affect you, your family, your work? And uh, if you can speak about what its significance is for you today, 10 years later. Uh, yeah, I think uh, going back to what Hamad said, like we just had hope, like we have a, like a country that's fair, that's not corrupt, that's like, respects us and uh, sorry um, uh, you know we can always come back and give you space to add more um, yeah. the format is flexible um, and we just have to speak up and say you know I, I want to add a little bit more and we're okay with that so next I'd like to go to Muhammad al Atar with the same question how did uh, the uprising affect uh, uh, you your family your work and today what is its significance to you 10 years later yeah uh, I mean this 
it's 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 very difficult to be brief, but I will try as much as I can. Listen, like th this changed our life, like really entirely. Like I mean, uh, the world we we knew uh, before it's 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 just gone. I mean, we we uh, it changed our life upside down. Uh, in, in a personal level, I mean, of course. Uh, um, uh, as I said, um, it, it it transformed my relation to Syria, transformed my relation to politics. I claim I was always political. I even uh, through my work, I do theater, I write for theater, I make theater. Uh, I always wanted to engage with politics, but we were practicing uh, in a country where you were deprived any rights to uh, to uh, show any political opinions. And out of sudden, uh, you had this uh, wonderful explosion, like a grassroots movement uh, with, uh, without uh, clear leaders, but uh, people, uh, especially from the countryside, rural areas, uh, uh, just uh, going out, trying to uh, create their agoras, uh, taking over streets and squares. Uh, to say finally no that we cannot accept this anymore uh, enough is enough you know uh, 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 shouting for freedom dignity and social justice uh, it changed everything it changed everything of course um, um, uh, the, I mean what happened later is known uh, no need maybe to go into details the brutal crackdown of the regime uh, the very violent response of the regime on peaceful protest led, led us later to a cycle of violence uh, and a, a, a proxy war, which of course, hopefully later we can also speak about because, uh, 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 I mean, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the, the war in Syria is described only as a civil war, which I think this is a mistake, a big mistake. It's a proxy war where uh, foreign uh, players, uh, international big powers or regional influential powers have an upper hand uh, in the war in Syria and in the destruction in Syria, uh, especially the packers of the Syrian regime. So uh, yes, I mean, after that, uh, we had uh, uh, one third of the Syrian population uh, became displaced. Uh, now, today, you have almost 90% um, of the Syrians who live in Syria, almost under the poverty line. Uh, uh, Syrians are scattered across the globe. Uh, uh, you have uh, uh, hundreds of thousands living in miserable situations, in, in, uh, either in the neighboring countries, in Lebanon, in Turkey, in Jordan, uh, or even in, the, in, in northwest Syria, in the province, for example, in tents and camps, in horrible conditions. Or so, so, and I, I would even go further and say that the, uh, the Syrian revolution and what happened after uh, uh, the violence and the war and the proxy war, I would say that not just changed the face of Middle East. I would say even beyond that, you know, we can uh, we can uh, I mean we can uh, expand more on this. But I would say that you have like uh, 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 a change in politics uh, across the globe actually as a consequence. I would say of how international community failed the Syrian people uh, to achieve their uh, legitimate uh, goal of creating uh, uh, a democracy, of, 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 uh, of achieving uh, dignity, justice, social justice, and political transition. So the, the, uh, the way we were like, uh, really, we were denied these goals, the way I, the way I think uh, uh, we were oppressed, not just by a very brutal dynasty inside Syria, also by counter-revolution forces, either in the region or also by agendas of uh, f uh, international or regional powers. I think uh, it left a very big trace uh, in Middle East and beyond even. And we are living with these consequences. We are living where, in an era where we see uh, right wing, uh, fascism, uh, radicalism uh, among, of course, uh, conservative Muslims. Uh, uh, it's spreading more and more and, 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 and gaining more ground. And, and, and I think it's part of it because uh, this uh, uh, peaceful revolution uh, was crushed brutally, again, uh, by, uh, by, by the regime and its backers and also by the hypocrisy of international community and by the intervention of regional and international powers. Uh, uh, yeah. So yeah, this is thank you so much.
Yeah, yeah no, no problem. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, we'll go next to Shiam. Uh, Shiam, if you could also respond to this question of how it affected you, your family, your work, and um, transition into what uh, you think the significance um, of this uprising and revolution is for you today. Um, I'm also going to invite you and other panelists, if you'd like, to speak a little bit more about the proxy war that Muhammad was, um, um, you know, uh, trying to draw draw our attention to. If you can kind of spell that out and describe the map of it, like what is the layout of that? What does that look like? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, I would say, <laughs> I uh, one of my big reflections at the ten year anniversary was maybe I should have done a, more to hide my name. <laughs> so I was about to start talking about my family and then I was like, well, wait, hold on, what are you gonna say? Um, most, yeah, most of my family is in Syria. Um, my name got anglic is anglicized when we moved to the US, but um, you know, my Beit Ghalyun and Beit Skaf, um, God, I keep giving information about who my family is. <laughs> Um, yeah, my entire family, I, um, was involved in every aspect, like political, uh, peaceful resistance, um, self-defense of neighborhoods, um, medical relief, um, detainment, um, forced disappearance, um, needing to make a decision whether or not to get on a raft to go across the Mediterranean. Um, those were very hard years, I think, um, for the majority, I, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I, I think for, for the majority of Syrians, certainly there wasn't, um, like every aspect of our lives were affected. Um, at the time I was about to graduate college and I wanted to work for the parks as a biologist. And, um, I didn't think that was relevant to... <laughs> That I took these pictures behind me. Um, I still very much love biology and the parks. But I started um, talking with more of the Syrians that I grew up here and trying to organize us. I was president of the Syrian American Council Houston chapter. Um, just really trying to find every opportunity to talk with people here about what was happening in Syria. Um, and right now, I would say my work really focuses on communications and narrative. Um, and that's because, you know, the United States, like Canada and Mexico and the, and the rest of the Americas, we're a settler colony. Um, and the way that we think about and understand um, politics outside of our border are, are it, it, like, um, It's very, you know, it seems simple that you would connect grassroots movement in one country to grassroots movement in, in another country. But the settler colonial stuff, I think um, it absolutely impacts how we understand the world or like how um, people based in the U.S. see themselves like in, in the world. Um, so to give you like a specific example of what I'm talking about, in 2003, the United States um, invaded and occupied Iraq um, and then engaged in a project of regime change. So when I started talking about what was happening in the region after 2011, people were really afraid of regime change. The difference is that this time the call for regime change was coming from people, uh, that they wanted to change their regimes. But anything that had to do with like because people here feel like they're, they're tricked by like, oh my God, I don't want to fall for anything again. Maybe there's some, and um, so there's a lot of communication challenges. Um, I think this, we could definitely dive into talking about the proxy war and how that's, you know, um, I would say one narrative that's like very tricky and frustrating is um, the narrative around intervention. I've always advocated for the right of people to request an intervention to stop their bomb, like being bombed or like be the imminent threat of genocide or extermination. Um, people requesting that is also not a request to be colonized. 
Um, but nobody wanted to hear it because they were like, oh, well, we might colonize you if we stop the bombs. And it's like, actually, no, we need to, we need to stand firm by people and be smart enough um, to express what, what, you know, to express this idea that we want the bombs to stop, but we don't want Syria to be colonized. Um, so when the conversation around like US intervention, it like took, it happened for many years, um, the U.S. has was already intervening. The U.S. intervenes in um, world, of, like world affairs, in many different levels by having a U.N. Security Council spot and a veto vote. They intervene because our country's um, opinion matters more than other countries who do or do not have veto power. Um, we manufacture and export weapons. Uh, we collaborate and train security forces around the world. Um, the idea that anyone can just not intervene in something that Syria is so isolated that we shouldn't intervene, it's very isolationist and xenophobic. Um, and also the U.S. did intervene under the war on terror through the U.S.-led coalition against Daesh, ISIS. Um, it was just intervention against an authoritarian leader. So it always explained to people how states are more likely to protect other states um, but we're, you know, when people talk about endless war or war expanding um, under the war on terror and the war on drugs in, in the United <laughs> States, it's really against um, militias and fighting militias. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, um, uh, Shiam. Uh, next, I'd like to go to Nura with the same question. Nora, did you want me to repeat it or uh, are you OK? Uh, no, I'm okay. Um, uh, actually, the effect is more than that I could ex describe. Um, I'm totally I'm a different person now. And uh, I, I don't even remember what, uh, what I was before the revolution, what I really wanted, uh, what was my dream, what was my needs. Uh, I just remember everything started since March 2011. Mm -hmm. But what was not uh, not new to me is that uh, I used to defend prisoners of conscience before the Supreme State Security Court, before the revolution. And after the revolution, it was like one of the most important demands in the, uh, in the revolution is to abolish the Supreme State Security Court. And this is what, what happened. But uh, of course, what, what, what really happened was worse because they create the counter of terrorism court. They, uh, reactivate the, um, the military field court uh, but like since the early days of the revolution I used to go to protest in, in Duma uh, to defend those great people who were detained uh, and to visit detainees in prison and um, what is like lasted uh, with me that I still want, like go to this prison for almost 22 years uh, from my life, which is more than the half of my life. And when my father was there, uh, his friends, my friends, my clients, and lately my my husband. Uh, for sure, the security situation was horrible for me, for Basil, for my family, and for my friends. And every day I, I was I'm still losing uh, some of my friends, of family member, many of uh, my my family members got uh, released. Uh, most of us were wanted, uh, observed, and followed up by the authority. Now, what I feel is, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I feel hopeless, actually, helpless. Um, I feel like I just want to go to to syria some way i just want to be with my family all my all my family is still in in damascus um i feel that i'm so far away i know that i i was like one of the last people who left syria i just left syria in 2018 and i still live in this uncertainty and confusion about basel fate um i just don't know what is it needed now to fix everything? Uh, 
I know just we need justice now, but I don't I don't know how we can achieve justice. For me, justice is to live with Basil, and this is impossible now. So any kind of justice is not sufficient and satisfied for me. Thank you so much for sharing those uh, words and um, sacred knowledge about what it has been like for you, um, the impact. Um, now, I have uh, an opportunity to transition into thinking through the representations of the uprising and revolution uh, through media, but I'm going to give a chat opportunity for um, uh, the panelists to uh, chime in on speaking anything else further with respect to the proxy war. I'm, I'm hoping that we could kind of map this out from the um, from your voices, your perspective. What what is it that was happening geopolitically uh, that led to the the heightening or f intensification of the repression and, and um, emboldening of Assad's um, uh, a, a, you know, uh, attack uh, towards um, uh, the uprising. Did anyone want to speak to this any further? Uh, I could. Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I think something we noticed um, when we were trying to, um, like I mentioned, support these regions that were um, autonomous or free from government control is um uh because of the proxy war uh i think um like mainly in the region it was um uh done through um iran and russia who were supporting the government and um the the armed part of the revolution who was supported by um, certain Gulf countries like Saudi Arabia and uh, and by the US through Saudi Arabia is um, they never wanted uh, the revolution to succeed but they didn't want uh, I mean like the armed part they never wanted that to succeed but they also didn't want it to um, sort of fade away or die down so the way they support was just like just enough to keep it going but not enough for it to succeed and i do feel that sort of dynamic did sort of um encourage assad to like know that like he's not gonna get um like he's gonna stay in power they're not gonna remove him they just want to um like see the country in ruins uh and yeah like it encouraged him enough to like even end up using um chemical weapons at certain points and uh yeah like he just knew like um uh, like he just knew that there wouldn't be any actual consequences there wouldn't be um uh, like he'd stay in power and yeah i and like um to like bring it uh bring it to what i think is uh, what should happen or like what is happening now um sorry um yeah, no problem. Um, you know what? It, I, I don't want to interrupt you. Please uh, continue if you'd like. Uh, I feel like a lot of what we're doing now, I was even doing it this morning, is um, argue with the like anti-imperialists about um, just even the... Like, like the idea of overthrowing the government is, I feel, not allowed in certain circles, and because they don't wanna, 
intervene, but like the truth is like they've been intervening um all along, just not in ways that actually help the Syrian people. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, unless anyone else wants to add to that, I'd like to transition. I'm going to take a moment and just hear, is there any more thoughts on this? Uh, yes, I, I would like to say, uh, to comment sure. on this, please. Uh, yes, uh, please. Uh, I, and I totally feel Allah and his, his emotion and his, his frustration also, because today uh, it's been 10 years and even a bit more than the start of the uh, revolution in Syria in March 2011. And as Ala briefly mentioned, we still, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, have to convince people who claim that they are progressive, they are leftists, anti-imperialists, anti -imperialists, uh, we still uh, have to convince them that uh, we have a legitimate right uh, to overthrow uh, a brutal criminal dynasty who served nobody but actually imperial powers uh, and and uh, uh, capitalist powers actually uh, through uh, the last decades in syria though they claim to be uh, anti-imperialist and socialist but that's that's very silly and fake claim and you don't need to be genius you don't need to be an expert to know that the uh, uh, it's an authoritarian uh, dynasty that used slogans uh, to build its premises and to uh, prevail. Uh, I, uh, speaking more about uh, both, like um, the media coverage and the proxy war, I think from early days of the revolution, we were. I mean, I mean, let's let's put another word. Part of the, uh, of the movement across Arab region and especially in Syria, you can say the same maybe in Libya, where the authoritarian regimes were much stronger and much brutal than countries like Tunis, Egypt or even Yemen or Bahrain or elsewhere of these countries that witnessed either a big movement or sometimes a smaller movement where unfortunately governments uh, managed to crush uh, uh, at early days. But in, in, in Syria, and in, in the Syrian case, uh, one of the main uh, things that people want is to regain their voice, to have their voice. And when, because Syria was absent, you know, uh, Syria. Think about North Korea today. What we do, what do? What do we know about North Korea? Like, like I'm not speaking about maybe the few scholars and academic and experts about North Korea. We know nothing. And and because uh, there is a regime that's been controlling and that turns uh, a country to a big prison, you know. And uh, and to a, to, a, to a similar extent, that was Syria before the revolution. I mean. Uh, uh, and 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 one of our main goals was was to have to free our voices. And when I speak about free our voices, there's two levels of that. Of course, internally, inside of Syria, that to, to free our voices and to to finally say no to this regime and to 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 uh, to show that we have uh, multiple voices, we have uh, uh, different voices. We are a rich community where also we have. Uh, different goals and ambitions and visions for the future that again I say we deserve but also uh, we wanted to uh, to have a voice uh, to speak about Syria on, on more the international level and that unfortunately didn't happen because from almost day one the, the, uh, the majority of literature about Syria is written by non-Syrians and the majority of that literature is written by non-Syrians who do not know much about Syria, whether uh, coming from bad intention or good intention. There were a lot of misinformation, stereotypes, uh, cliches, focusing on, on certain topics, of course, uh, uh, it's only civil war, or focusing on the phenomena like IS only. So you like for 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 uh, for long periods like you feel that in syria what's happening it's only a a a a, a, a battleground between a regime and its backers and between uh, uh, uh radical groups like us and that's it and and but where is the syrian people where is the, i'd say the majority of syrian people where are those who uh, uh, started a, a brave, uh, a miraculously brave revolution in 2011. Nothing about them, and nothing about their ambitions, their goals, you know. And and to, 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 to a certain extent, this is what we 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 are still witnessing today. We are, and that's why it's it's a bit uh, frustrating, and I would say even. Um, 
I mean, it's, this, we have this bitterness as Syrians, whether in Syria still or in diaspora, wherever we are, that even after 10 years, we are still struggling to uh, narrate or to create, to, to, uh, to, to tell our story uh, and to be heard. And, and, and sometimes actually, and, and, and back to Allah's point, sometimes this, this, um, uh, this frustration is more because you need to convince people that you would think that they are on the same front, that they are also fighting oppression and fighting uh, uh, different way, uh, different forms of oppression, uh, of course, capitalism or, or imperialism, so that you need till today to convince them that, uh, you know what, I mean, you don't know much about Syria and you want to lecture us about Syria or you want to impose uh, an old narrative, a narrative of the Cold War that doesn't exist any, anymore. Uh, Shia mentioned that briefly, like, they want to lecture us all the time that, okay, you are a champion of regime change, so you are serving American agendas. But no, no at all, because we, it's not Americans. Actually, Americans didn't want, and that, I, I would say personally that Americans never wanted regime change in Syria, never wanted Assad dynasty to change in Syria. Uh, uh, not the Israelis, not the Europeans, they never really cared about it. It, it was the Syrian people who wanted this change. And uh, they were, uh, of course, uh, they were denied this, uh, uh, by, by, of course, by, by Russia and Iran, and also by, again, uh, other, other uh, forces who only saw in Syria uh, 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 a ground to, to achieve agendas, but not the agenda of the Syrian people the, or the majority of Syrian people who really wanted to achieve a, a democratic transition. So, uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's why, for example, uh, 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 weeks ago, uh, I think Shyam was in the group. We released a statement to to condemn like a lot of intellectuals or uh, scholars uh, from the uh, from the international left or from the inter uh, imperialist campaigns who still till today uh, uh, find apologies uh, for Assad uh, or for its backers, the Russians or Iranians, and still to today insist that. Uh, 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 the demand in Syria to overthrow uh, this dynasty is actually uh, mobilized by Americans or by NATO. These are fake, these are uh, shameful accusations against people who wanted to liberate their voice, who wanted to uh, regain their agency and, and to really like uh, try to build uh, a democracy, try to build a country where people can debate, where people actually can bring the conflicts uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to a real parliament, not, not like a fake uh, parliament like what we have today in Syria. In Syria today, you know, uh, maybe uh, you or some of the audience are not, uh, do not know or not updated, they are preparing for an election now. Imagine like an election where, of course, Assad, uh, uh, he will win. It's just a fake election where Russians are, 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 are of course, using just to say that, okay, uh, things are going back to normal and uh, international community need to put money in Syria now for construction. So this is, this is what's happened after 10 years. We are still struggling till today to uh, convince uh, uh, not just people from right wing, unfortunately people are also on the left wing, uh, that uh, we have a legitimate uh, uh, cause in uh, overthrowing uh, Assad dynasty. Um, thank you, um, uh, Mohammed. That makes sense. Uh, so, in terms of uh, the 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 next part of our conversation, we can either choose to dwell into some of the other questions, or uh, you know, transition at this time. Uh, if it's okay with you all, uh, I'd like to kind of uh, go through some of the other questions that I have. If we could kind of just be conscious of time, though. Um, so. Uh, are we okay to go into some of the other questions that um, I had mentioned earlier? Okay. Um, uh, in terms of my next question for you, if we can touch on media a little bit, um, what do you think were some problematic competing narratives about um, the, uh, uh, sorry, problematic competing media narratives about what was happening in Syria or still continue to show up in media narratives about how to understand what's happening in um, Syria. Now, I, I hear a little bit of like, you know, um, this uh, geopolitical um, 
uh, proxy war and the way it unfolded, uh, shaping a lot of the media narratives, I would imagine. Um, and as well as, as you mentioned, uh, the way um, some of the quote unquote non Syria, Syria experts getting a lot of space to speak on it. What else was happening? Do you think that was problematic and that needs to change you know, uh, in order for there to be proper representation uh, for Syria in uh, media? And I'll go to Noura first for this question. Uh, okay. Um, actually, um, the media issues uh, itself is very problematic uh, because I I don't think there is any kind of neutral, transparent media. Like we have different kinds of media. For example, the the Syrian official media described and still the events in Syria as it a kind of universal conspiracy against Syria our terrorists against the state and the civilians um, or extremists um, against the fake secularism uh, so and they are still on the same scenarios and propaganda for almost 10 years and um like uh, uh, it's surprising that there's still people uh, believe everything they are saying not only Syrians, but only people abroad. And we have the, uh, like, like, let's say other kind of media that they are really overacting in accusing the regime, for example, for issues that happened and other things that not happened or like just focusing on the Syrian regime, uh, regardless of the other, parties who are like committing violations also every day for sure it's not comparable with with what the regime are are doing and for sure we we are at least myself i'm insisting that the syrian regime um uh, is the main uh, and essential reason of everything is happening in syria of all this um um foreign uh, intervention in in syria um also like we have this kind of uh media and it's uh, not few actually it's a lot of media that consider what is happening as it a civil war and trying to approach it with other scenarios in other countries um sadly there is very rare media that shows what is really happened and uh like rare media uh show us as non-violent as peaceful as secular uh activists uh, uh and for sure that this uh impact of media for, for myself um, like my my last two years in syria i was not only afraid from the syrian regime i was afraid uh from people uh who like saw me in in street or my neighbors because like let's say the uh opposition media are, um i was always on tvs on social media the official media are like talking uh the contrast about about me uh, so it was really danger for for me to be living um like uh, among those people who I don't know, maybe like sometimes people stop me in the street and want just to me, hi, we saw you on TV, or we saw you on like uh, something on social media. But actually, sometimes I face people who like just threaten me and uh, just angry with me because I'm, I don't know, I'm a kind of terrorist or a spy or I don't know. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, and the next, um, should we go to, um, I, I want to kind of give an opportunity to anyone who wants to go first. Uh, Shame, are you okay to go now? Or would you like to wait? Oh, I can go now. Could you repeat the question? Uh, of course, yeah. So what are some problematic um, media narratives that you observed? Um, play out um, and you think are continuing to play out um, and what needs to be done differently to better support uh, or sorry better represent uh, Syrian uh, people in the media 
what has to change? Thank you. Um, I'm glad that Nora brought up the, um, the narrative that only the Assad regime is like, it's like the only um, perpetrator of violence in the country. Um, and certainly um, they disproportionately are fueling uh, a lot of the violence. And I would say that they're primarily culpable as the head of the state for um, a lot of what has happened. Um, but what I think is really important to remember is that the whole point of revolution is um, to have different voices and different opinions. So revolutionary spaces are not homogenous. Um, Essidist spaces are homogenous. <laughs> There's one line, one narrative. Uh, you can't say anything else besides that. Um, so I'm glad that I'm glad that Nora brought that up. Um, I also think it's important, um, also just for like revolutionary purposes, that anyone who's um, culpable in perpetuating violence like go through an accountability process, um, and that people should not be afraid of accountability in revolutionary spaces. Um, one narrative, I think that there's many narratives that we could talk about in the media. One that comes to mind as being somebody, again, based in the United States, and I think people based um, in other like white majority, uh, so-called Western uh, countries can, will probably also recognize this, but the narrative that a certain group of people, they're just refugees. So in the United States, it was like, the Democrats only wanted to see Syrians as refugees coming in, and they did not want to talk about the revolution, as said, what was driving the refugee crisis. Um, and I think Republicans, because of um, just because of you know their own their own interests and their own worldview on on foreign policy, um, did want to focus on Assad, but they did not want to let refugees in. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a very problematic and frustrating narrative. Um, yeah, just, and I'm sure my, my uh, co-panelists can, there's like many more to touch upon, interested in hearing from them. Uh, can we go next to Allah? Yeah. Um... I kind of actually want to talk about um, like um, media net, like it's something like I'm been like concerned about a media narrative that might happen. Um, like, I mean, it's already happening in Denmark, um, but like it could also like start happening elsewhere, which is um, Especially like with the so with the, like the elections coming up in Syria, um, the media sort of stating that it's safe and uh, refugees um, uh, should go back and the civil war is over. Um, uh, I think like that's so wrong and so unsafe and uh, it really needs to be challenged uh, and I'm really grateful um, to you and Kashmir Golpish for like um, having this event because like that's uh, uh, like like that's the type of things that need to start happening more and we especially should start trying to um, reach out and like build bridges um, because it definitely could happen in the future. Um, yeah, like reactionaries and uh, like right wingers would be like send go like send them back. It's safe there and. Uh, yeah like i'm sorry i said thank you yeah 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 um 
in the interest of time, I'm just going to kind of keep uh, um, now recommending that we take about one minute uh, per question. Okay. I know it's not fair, uh, but I, I do have like um, two other questions that I'd like to ask and then show that um, a short uh, documentary clip uh, and then move into Q&A. So, um, uh, Mohammed, uh, would you also like to speak on uh, the problematic media narratives that you've seen in the past or you continue to see and what needs to change in the media uh, for uh, Syrian people to be properly represented? Uh, uh, I, I prefer to focus on the now. Uh, okay. I think I think uh, we maybe uh, mentioned a few aspects of the pro uh, problems of the media coverage in the past um, years. But but I think now okay I mean um, we need also to start I uh, start to realize that we are of course in a, in a, in a different um, moment now entirely we are not uh, in 2011 uh, I mean I, I briefly mentioned before some figures about about the poverty about the suffering how do Syrians live especially Syrians inside of Syria regardless where they are because. Uh, the reality today is Syria is also scattered to, to many Syrians. You know, there's a Syria that's controlled by the regime and its backers, Iranian militias, and of course, Russian forces. And there's uh, a Syria that is controlled by uh, militias that are backed by Turkey. And there's, of course, North uh, East Syria where uh, uh, there's Kurdish forces supported by uh, international coalition, uh, of course, mainly uh, the United States. So, and of course, you have the Jordan Heights, which is occupied by Israel. So, uh, this is this is Syria today. It's 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 different Syrias on the ground. But but I mean, maybe what unfortunately what brings uh, all Syrians, regardless where they live today in Syria, is that they they the the, the hardships of life. It's 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 uh, very very tough economical situations and the pandemic of course didn't make things easier at all. So the, the, uh, and of course we have uh, uh, as I said uh, uh, one third of the Syrian population is displaced I, either internally or also millions are are uh, are outside uh, of Syria. So this is we need we need to to, to uh, of course to acknowledge this situation. And start from here, and uh, and uh, the major problems today actually is actually the lack of uh, decent coverage of Syria. Uh, let's say comparing to the problem at the early days of the revolution, that was a lot of coverage of Syria. But uh, for me personally, that most of that coverage was uh, not accurate or actually not deep enough. Today, there is a lack of coverage of Syria. There is just, uh, Syria is messed uh, among the headlines, of course. And this is one of the side effects of the pandemic worldwide that for months and months, you only hear about COVID. Of course, COVID is a huge thing, but as if the world stopped, as if the disasters or the atrocities or wars or uh, uh, other huge problems, uh, uh, I mean, disappeared. Uh, they Unfortunately, they didn't disappear. They even escalated more. Uh, but because of the dominance of the pandemic, uh, you rarely now uh, uh, see uh, a news uh, beside that or not related directly or, or indirectly to the pandemic and the vaccine and all of that. And Syria is, is, is a victim of that. Uh, again, I'm not saying that uh, uh, just Syria needs to be in the headlines. It needs uh, how it should be, I feel, in the news. I think uh, one of the biggest challenges today is to deconstruct uh, this, for example, a very uh, fake and vicious uh, political process that the Russians try to impose, uh, the Russians and the Iranians, but mainly the Russians, because the Russians have strong uh, uh, media arm, international, of course, uh, and, and mainly now this, this game of, 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 um, of uh, silly game, actually, of election. Actually, maybe one of the good things is to uh, is to totally ignore it. Uh, to ignore it. I, I I was in a discussion with uh, Syrian friends and comrades, and we kind of concluded internally that maybe the best way to counter this uh, 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 silly election narrative is just to ignore it. But uh, because uh, because Alaa, for example, mentioned Denmark and what's happening in Denmark, which is really uh, horrible now, they forcing uh, Syrian refugees to be deported claiming that, for example, Damascus is safe. Maybe there is no, uh, Damascus is not a war zone, but it's far from being safe because of the regime and because the regime is still detaining. And these things are 
well documented. I think Nora uh, knows better uh, about this regard. But uh, and, and and when I speak about documentation, I'm not speaking about just uh, uh, Syrians uh, and Syrian organizations who I think they do brilliant work in documenting uh, the co uh, the continuous uh, violations of human rights by the Syrian regime and also by other Syrian militias, even backed by either United States in Northeast Syria or by Turkey in Northwest Syria, that there is still a lot of human rights violations. But also these documentations are coming from uh, neutral uh, international organizations and, 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 uh, and uh, there is no lack of information on this regard. So for the government or politicians in Denmark, for example, saying that it's safe now to deport Syrians back to Damascus because there's no war, this is a very uh, dangerous thing. It's a fake claim. Mm -hmm. So this is just one example how, uh, for example, media can work now to deconstruct such claims that coming either, for example, again, by mm -hmm. Russians and co who claiming that uh, Syria is witnessing now a political transition and now uh, you will have, a, 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 for example, an election or uh, another narrative coming now for, from the Danish, uh, some Danish politicians, unfortunately, not just from the right wing, apparently it's even some from the left wing, they're saying that, for example, Damascus is safe, you can deport refugees back now uh, to Damascus because it's safe. So a lot, again, of misinformation, a lot of uh, imposed false okay. agendas, uh, that speak in Syria, uh, speak on behalf of Syrians or about Syria, but they just uh, serve uh, nothing but, again, uh, for me, uh, wrong agendas about Syria. Right. Um, wow, really well put in a, a very short amount of time. Thank you so much. Um, one thing I'd like to note is that we are trying to cover a very large uh, number of themes um, in a short amount of time. Uh, so um, my apologies for kind of, you know, trying to restrict the, the speaking. Um, uh, uh, Benish, I, I, just, I just have suggestions. Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt you, I'm very sorry. But because of the limited time, I'm, I'm, I don't know, maybe it's fair to open up for if there is questions from audience, because I don't yeah. want also to end yeah. up just speaking and maybe there's some people who want to. What, what uh, this is only my suggestion, of course. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's your call and your decision. Yeah, of, course. Organizers, yeah. of course, yeah. No, no, thank you for your uh, recommendation. Uh, what we'd like to do uh, at this time in ju is just to kind of uh, take a pause. Um, I mentioned earlier that we'd like to show a small clip from a documentary uh, film. Um, so uh, we're going to screen that now. The film is called Syria, Syria was once a beautiful country. Uh, the film emerged from a research project led by Dr. Merunissa Ali at Ryerson University, and it was directed by Cyrus Sundar Singh. A link to where you can watch the film is available in the comments and the description of this broadcast below. Um, and um, it's an opportunity for us to um, center Syrian children's voices, which we have not previously heard um, in this conversation, but is also also absent in a lot of the other conversations that are happening uh, about Syria. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, transition us into watching that film clip. When the war started in Syria, we ran to other countries. People always ask grown-ups about what happened, but no one asks children. But Mehru, Gina, and Nancy asked 13 of us what we remembered about Syria. The countries we ran to and our early days in Canada. We talked to them many times and made our own memory books. Then one day in November, we all gathered and shared our stories with each other. The story of my life in Syria. I remembered my, myself in a garden. I was born in Syria. We didn't stay a long time in Syria. This is me, Ahmed, and my dad. This is my mom, Lydra. The circle lights is me, um, I remember from Syria that my family and me, we had a lovely house. Uh, and we could sleep on the roof. 
because um, the, the roof is flat. I was born and so I like playing with my sister. Sometimes we play tag, sometimes I just sneak. Where do you hide? <laughs> It's a bunker. Sometimes we play like Sham is the mom and our friend is the dad and we're all the kids. My, all my friends like and aunties one time came to us. My mom make food and dad and then we had a food together. Once in my uncle's house, he had a fountain. Me and my brother Yusuf were swimming inside the fountain. My aunt saw me upside down. Uh, sorry about that. I was on mute. That was the film. Syria was once a beautiful country and it's something that you can watch further. It's 15 minutes in length. Um, we provided the link for it um, in our comments um, as well as a description of the broadcast. Um, uh, next, uh, uh, in our next segment, uh, we would like to go into a Q&A. Um, I'm going to ask that uh, our uh, Q&A um, title come up. Uh, folks who want to ask questions can do so now through our um, uh, live broadcast in the comments section. Uh, we can see them. If um, when any of the panelists have questions, uh, they're also uh, welcome to present them at this time. Um, I don't see any questions at the moment uh, uh, in the live broadcast from uh, the viewers. Um, if there are, um, we'll see them. So I'm just checking in our chat. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of um, comments about uh, the broadcast in people's uh, sentiments and a lot of positive support I see. Um, I'm not seeing questions though. So I, we, we will continue to monitor for questions um, that will come up. Uh, but in the meanwhile, I, uh, I did have a question um, for all of you. Um, and you're welcome to ask questions of your own as well. Um, can you tell us, um, What's ahead for Syrian people? What needs to be done for their vision of peaceful, for vision of a peaceful, just Syria to become a reality? And this could uh, be anyone, so please feel to, uh, free to speak up. Um, I could share some some thoughts very briefly. Um, I think that the struggle against authoritarianism is global. Um, and um, it, it, it also seems like the Syrian struggle will be multi-generational. Um, so it just, I, I think um, right now, I think, you know, we can talk about like very specific things that like are in front of us. Um, Nora, who's a lawyer, might be able to speak more um, about, you know, there's like a constitutional process and there's like different things going on. Um, and, um, but I would just say like very briefly that I, I do think it's a multi-generational struggle um, and that it's an international struggle um, and that the Syrian struggle against authoritarianism is also um, you know, the, the struggle against authoritarianism in Myanmar, the push for justice um, for the disappeared people under Pinochet's regime in, in Argentina. Um, you know, Syria as a security state, um, there's a huge conversation now about policing and security states. And I think the issue of police, policing and prisons really like connects a lot of struggles together. And I do think that um, that we're looking at a multi-generational fight. Thank you. Anyone else um, want to speak to that? What needs, what does it take for um, a peaceful and just Syria to become a reality? What will it take? Um, okay, I can briefly answer. Um, 
I don't think there is any kind of uh, justice or solution now uh, without the political transition, actually. Um, there is anything can be done without this transition, actually. And this transition seems to be impossible right now because we know that there is uh, no any horizon for, um, let's say, uh, political international uh, resolution or willingness uh, for stopping these crimes in Syria, despite of that there is very obvious who is committing these crimes. And I'm sorry to say that many of states uh, in this huge international community are giving us a kind of gift uh, from time to time, while what is needed is uh, to remove the Syrian regime uh, from the power in Syria. And uh, for sure, maybe after this uh, um, stage, we need to fix and develop and create a fair law, uh, a fair constitution uh, to take into consideration all the Syrians' backgrounds or the Syrians' point of views um for sure we need this kind of social justice for syrians but it's it's very important to focus right now and right here about the syrian needs now like um like Muhammad said uh like huge numbers of syrian are displaced uh, internal or um, out of, of syria so they have multiple uh needs and this is must be solved Thank you. I also can add uh, briefly, I think there is, um, it's really, yeah, I don't know. It's, I mean, when you look at reality today and I'm not really pessimistic at all, uh, it's bleak. It's, uh, it's very, dif very difficult. It's, it's um, like, um, yeah, uh, you struggle to find glimpses of, of hope or ways out of this very complicated situation. But I, I, I think there's two fronts we have and we are working i mean with maybe maybe i mean already because i, I cannot I, i'm not speaking on behalf of syrians i'm just now uh, really uh, uh, say what i think the first front is what nura uh, uh, just mentioned is the direct response to a very uh, miserable humanitarian conditions now especially for syrians who live uh, in syria or the neighboring countries in a very uh, uh, and humane uh, conditions. So this is something you need the direct response for that. Uh, but I, I say in that, but I don't think that the direct response is only, uh, uh, it should be an, a political human response because this is also a mistake because this is not, uh, uh, despite the fact that it's one of the biggest human tragedies in modern era, but it was not caused by earthquakes. It was not caused by tsunami. So even the humanitarian response should uh, go side by side with uh, a political solution. So you cannot really, and that's actually what the regime or or, or other like uh, players uh, they want. They want to uh, 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 to create uh, uh, or to maybe provide uh, humanitarian aid or response or speak about reconstruction and these topics without tackling the main issue, which is the political transition, which is the need to uh, achieve a political change in Syria. So, so, we're just at time. If you yeah, could wrap so, up, yes, thank you. So yeah, I just want to, to, to assure that that, that this, this uh, need to address the humanitarian crisis today, it's urgent, but it shouldn't be, uh, how to say, apolitical. The other things that I really just want to mention very briefly, which is for the long term, is uh, is to overcome uh, depression because I think this is the main tr struggle of Syrians today. Again, how we are individually or in groups, small groups, how uh, we can overcome uh, this feeling of helplessness, hopelessness, and depression. And I, th I think the way out of that is, is to focus on what is possible. And what is possible sometimes, it's small, but it's not meaningless. It's what, like what Noura does, it's what Allah is doing, it's what uh, Shiam is doing, it's to, uh, organizing by focusing on the uh, uh, on, on uh, documentation or focusing on trying to put 
uh, some of the perpetrators into trials or uh, in, in the field of art, of culture, by producing a new forms that can address the Syrian agony in a creative way, in a way that uh, do not make us uh, captives uh, or, or in capture of, of, of narrative of victimhood, because we are not victims, actually. We are people who are struggling for justice and social justice. So I think uh, the second thing is a longer term, is, uh, is how can we overcome depression? How we cannot allow this bleak current situation to uh, push us into despair and the depression. And uh, we can do this by focusing on maybe small initiatives, on organizing ourselves, wh whether inside or outside, especially in diaspora, and focusing on what is possible to be done today. Though it could be limited and small, but I, I do believe it's not meaningless. Thank you, Mohammed, so much for uh, that response. Um, uh, we're at time uh, today uh, for- Can I just uh, say something? Sorry, can I just say something for a minute about this? Uh, as uh, I'll, I have 30 seconds, so I just have to wrap okay, up. Okay, okay. Uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, like I just feel, um, obviously it, it would have been better if uh, the government was gone in 2012, 2013. But I still think like that's the most important thing. Um, it's way more complicated now, but like, he still needs to go. There's 6.6 .6 million Syrians outside, and I'm confident most of them would go back um, once he leaves. And we need that to happen first before anything else can, like, there is a lot to fix, but he needs to leave first. Like, we can't start until he leaves. Thank you, Allah, for uh, that uh, input into the conversation. Really appreciate it. Um, I just want to um, um, uh, mention two questions that we didn't get a chance to tackle, but I think it's important to note um, we didn't talk about the impact of the pandemic on Syrians who are living in Syria. I think that's really important. And uh, talking about the global system of apartheid, vaccine apartheid, which is impacting um, you know, um, countries who are in political states of crisis or dealing with repressive uh, regimes. Um, so I would ask, I would encourage you to read up more about that on your own uh, for the audience who's watching. I'd also like you to think about ways you can be in solidarity. So some of the ways uh, you can be in solidarity have already been outlined by our panelists panelists today um, in talking about problems with the media, how to do it differently, like centering and uplifting, not uplifting, but you know, centering and privileging Syrian voices about Syria, continuing to pay attention, continuing to pay attention to the organizing that's happening by Syrians themselves and supporting that work. So I would ask you to, uh, you know, follow these wonderful folks uh, on their social media uh, accounts. Um, uh, I want to thank each of you, uh, Shiam, Noura, uh, Mohammed, and Allah for joining us today and for sharing your wisdom in such a uh, passionate and uh, grounded way. Um, many, many thanks for you uh, to join us today. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, also thank the audience for joining us today. Uh, please uh, share your thoughts in the comments be below. You can share the video, um, follow our social media accounts to keep in touch with us. Uh, below, you'll see a link to our websites and a donations page. Uh, we are an independent uh, media platform as part of Kashmir Go Posh, so we're continuing to uh, uh, we're trying to continue to bring you such programming and uh, we have bills to pay like you know paying for our website and very small things uh, this is all unpaid work but if you could donate a little bit that would help us continue to keep this work going would appreciate that with that said thank you so much once again and uh, have a good day